At this point, I've described how to create a plasmid containing a gene of interest, transform the plasmid into E. coli, and verify that the cloned plasmid is actually the one you want. Now I want to talk a bit about how you overexpress and purify your favorite protein. The basic steps in the process are listed here. I've already talked about how to put your gene into a plasmid, and I'll talk more about the characteristics a protein expression plasmid should have shortly. You grow the cells containing the plasmid in a liquid culture and induce a high level of expression from the gene. When you have a lot of the cells, you collect them and then lyse them or break them open. You often break cells open using physical methods that disrupt the cell wall and cell membrane. You then usually do a centrifugation step to remove the remnants of the cell wall and membrane, after which you are left with a complicated mixture of all the soluble proteins and other molecules that were in the cell. To separate your favorite protein from other proteins, you usually use column chromatography. There are different types of chromatography which separate proteins based on different properties such as size or charge. Very commonly, to simplify purification, people will engineer an affinity tag into their protein of interest at the level of the gene, as I'll describe later in this video. And finally, we need a way to check the purity of our protein preparation. In the rest of this video, I want to focus on the properties a plasmid should have if it is to be used for protein overexpression, and I want to show an analysis of a sample purification. This figure shows the main features that an overexpression plasmid or vector should have. The features that you should remember are in the red boxes. The plasmid must have an origin of replication so that cells can make more copies of it. Several examples of replication origins are listed on the figure. You don't need to worry about the details of these, but it's worth noting that some origins result in many copies of the plasmid per cell, and some origins result in relatively few. The plasmid should have a promoter that the bacterial RNA polymerase can recognize. Ideally, this promoter would contain regulatory sequences that allow transcription of the gene to be turned on at a specific point in the growth of the bacterial culture. Often, promoters are used that are based on the LAC promoter, which is turned on when lactose, or a lactose analog, is added to the culture. You need to make sure the messenger RNA has a ribosome binding site so that the mRNA can be translated. To simplify purification, you usually want to uh, include a protein affinity tag in the gene. The tag is usually put at either the 5' prime end or the 3' prime end of the gene so that the tag will be found at the N terminus or the C terminus of the polypeptide. Some tags are short sequences such as the flag tag, which is a specific 8 amino acid sequence that is specifically recognized by an antibody. Another tag that is often used is a polyhistidine tag in which six or eight histidine residues appear in a row. These consecutive histidines will bind to nickel ions immobilized on a chromatography column. Often you include a sequence that is the target for a specific protease such that the affinity tag can be removed from the protein product. Sometimes it doesn't matter if the affinity tag stays on, especially if the tag is small. Of course, you want your favorite gene in the plasmid, and you should also include a transcription terminator so that RNA polymerase knows when to stop making the mRNA. And finally, the plasmid should have some kind of selectable marker, as explained earlier, so you can identify cells that contain the plasmid. This SDS page gel shows the progress of a typical affinity-based protein purification procedure. Lane 1 contains the crude cell extract, or cells that have overexpressed the protein of interest and have been broken open. You can see a heavy band at this location of the lane, which represents the overexpressed protein of interest. The other bands in the lane are proteins normally produced by the bacterium. This overexpressed protein has a 6-histidine tag at its N-terminal end. The cell extract was added to a nickel-containing affinity column. The sample that emerged from the column contained all the proteins from the cell extract, except for the thick overexpressed band. This protein remained behind, stuck to the nickel on the column. You want to wash the column well to remove all unwanted proteins, leaving only the protein of interest behind on the column. 
you then can elute the protein of interest by adding a molecule that competes with the protein for binding to the nickel. This elution buffer will outcompete the protein of interest for binding to the column, and the desired protein will come off the column in a greatly purified form. You can see that this protein is the main component of that eluted solution. Once you have the purified protein, you can study its structure and function to learn how it works. Or, in the case of something like insulin, you could use it as a therapeutic, if it's pure enough. In this series of videos, I've led you through the basic steps for cloning a gene into a plasmid, adding the plasmid to bacteria, and purifying the protein product. Along the way, I have described some key tools in biotechnology. In the final video in this series, I want to introduce the idea of modifying an organism's genome itself, rather than introducing a gene on an extra-chromosomal piece of DNA.